As we speak of invisibility, we render it visible through our words. We further speak of it as though it were a monolithic, homogeneous thing. But the first probing question to ask would be, is there more than one invisibility? Try to imagine it. Land it, if not a certain form locked within recognizable outlines, then at least an atmospheric feel. Whose invisibility is it? What remains withdrawn from sight? A burglar waiting in the shadows? Political and economic backroom deals? Hidden cameras and digital surveillance? Radiation? Climate change? A virus? Some kinds of invisibility are heavy with suspense, concentrated in a single moment of time. Others are subtly weighing on us for long periods. Some are provisional. Others are highly resistant to the possibility of emerging into a field of vision. Some only need to be exposed in the media or by shining a small flashlight to be brought out of their retreat. Others require sophisticated tools, microscopes or Geiger counters to register as images or as the more or less abstract measurements. When after the 1986 disaster, the need arose to put a face on the transnational threat of radioactive fallout, the Soviet regime was, in part rightly, blamed for contributing to the event's non-transparency out of purely ideological motivations. With the suppression of initial medical reports on the novel coronavirus by the Chinese state apparatus in the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, a similar situation developed. Mainstream media in the West called it China's Chernobyl moment. But when the epidemic spread to Europe and the Americas, the virus was figured otherwise, as an invisible enemy. It is tempting, to be sure, to assuage our anxieties and to placate our fears of the unknown and the unseen by giving them a definite figuration, by tying them to a this, something that can be pointed out. The figure of an enemy usually does the trick, as it binds negative affect, hatred and animosity to itself it also helps consolidate a community of those fighting together against the threat it represents. Declarations of war against an invisible enemy, however, follow a logic of their own. Despite identifying the hostile force, they distend and ultimately wash away its outlines, leaving it indeterminate and potentially ever-present. Objectless anxiety persists with the added bonus of odium tacked into a general militaristic framework. In this anniversary month of the nuclear disaster, when the pandemic is supposedly at its peak in Europe, 
forest fires have been ravaging Chernobyl's exclusion zone. Its thermal power is obviously not handed over to sight, but to touch. involving the entire dimension of our carnality. And its luminosity is uneven. The flames dancing and smoke simultaneously counteracting its action. Smoke is a trace of matter, of wood and of the woods that sublime and sublimated shoot up into the sky. Around Chernobyl, this elevated matter carries radioactive materials along. Invisibly. Obscurely. Fire spreads as though by contagion. Its tongues lick dry vegetal stuff that so touched joins the blaze. A spark jumps from one area to another disregarding limits, boundaries, borders. A virus too grows like fire with particularly contagious varieties. A viral spark reproduces rapidly, moving from host to host at the lightest of contacts. What does it mean to be or to find myself often in retrospect in proximity to the invisible? Sometimes invisibility is so close that it is inside myself. Think of contagion, be it physical or spiritual. It shapes the self I call mine. There is a sense that you are being watched while not seeing who or what is watching you. Becoming the object of a gaze you cannot return of a sense you are unable to sense is a consequence of exposure and the premonition of your becoming object, a body, living or dead, living and dead. It is learning to live in the face of death and hence learning to think.